image of God in Catholic theology, Western theology, Eastern theology, you name it. If it's Orthodox, that's where you find it. The image of God has nothing to do with genitalia, has nothing to do with eyeballs and nostrils and fingers and hearts and kidneys and hip sockets and hair. The image of God has nothing to do with that because guess what? Your dog has all that stuff. Maybe not fingers. He's got paws. The image of God is your rationality and your free will. It's your intellect and your will. That's the image of God. What makes us different from all the animals, from the sea whales and the zebras and the monkeys and the squirrels and the fish? What makes us different from all of them? We all have eyeballs. We all have mouths. What's different? We are endowed with reason and free will. They are not. The image and likeness of God is not something you can see in a photograph of a person. The image of God is what you see in their behavior in that they are, by their intellect, able to do logical syllogisms. If I do this, B will happen. They can also abstract forms and essences from things. They begin to understand, okay, I've seen uh, this is an oak tree, that's an oak tree. These are all oak trees. They begin to have understanding of genus and species. They understand language. They understand cause and effect. This is what it means to be human. We can build cities, build cathedrals, record music. It's because we have an intellect and a will. This is why getting drunk and high is a mortal sin. Because every time you get drunk or high, you mute or turn down your intellect and your will. You don't think right, that's your intellect, and you make bad choices, that's your will. You become like an animal. So when it says that God created them in his image, male and female, what it's saying, not that God is male and female, but he's saying that both boys and girls have an intellect and a free will. This is a powerful statement for Christians. We believe that male and female have an equal dignity, equal dignity in that both are made in the image and likeness of God. I have an intellect and will. My wife has an intellect and will. My sons have an intellect and a will. My daughters have an intellect and a will. How beautiful is that? That is the Catholic teaching. So what we're doing is, in Catholic te theology, is we're saying, what makes God, one of the things that's so awesome about God is he has an intellect and a will. And he takes that feature of himself and places it on us so that we're in his image. Because obviously God is invisible. But we have the intellect and will. What the feminist scholar does is they flip it and they say, well, we got boys and we got girl bodies, and so let's push that upward into God. Mm, no, that's not what Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 is trying to teach us. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So you can see here that these three arguments fail. Sophia is not God. Number two, mothering language is just analogies. It never yields to God as a she. And number three, God transcends maleness and femaleness, but he revealed himself as the groom, as the husband, and thus always and everywhere uses he. All you got to do to one of these feminists is say, well, show me the one verse that says she in the whole Bible. The one she. Give me the one she. And they can't do it. Because God has preferred pronouns. And you should tell these liberals, well, are you saying that I should respect the pronouns of everybody on Twitter when they list their pronouns? Yes, of course you should. Okay, well, why don't we respect the pronouns of God? God has the preferred pronouns. It's he, him, himself, every single time. For ever. Forever. Forever. 
in secula seculorum.